Hello, I'm Bishop John, Chairman of the Task Force on Mental Health for the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops. Because we are living in such complicated times, the bishops are reaching out to leaders of our community to help our faithful navigate. Two experts on healthy living and thinking are Professors Al Rossi from St. Vladimir Seminary and PhD candidate Kate McRae, an ethicist and theologian from Canada. Both are talented gifts who integrate psychology, theology, canon law, and concepts of healthy living. We are really blessed to have them with us. Dr. Rossi, what is mental health and what does it have to do with our faith and people? Sure, I'm honored to be here and dear friends of both of you, and we'll dive right in. And I, I think we really need the definition for clarity. And there is a muddle, lack of clarity in some, many orthodox circles. I use Father John Meindorf's pivotal statement at the St. Vladimir's Institute one summer when he said, the human being consists in body, psyche, psyche, and spirit. If you have a problem with your body, you go to a physician. If you have a problem with your psyche, you go to a counselor or a therapist. If you have a problem with your spirit, you go to a, a priest or a bishop. <clears throat> so your question, what is mental health? According, and I think we need clarity, the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own capabilities can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. I think that needs to be out there. Summarized, it's the ability to work and love, to relate properly and provide something that in some way adds to the betterment of the, of the planet. Father Hopko said that Sanity, mental health, equals sanctity. Now that's a whole discussion for the future, but he looked at Jesus as a model for sanity and sanctity. So we could explore sanity in Jesus. Sanctity is pretty clear. I also think that within the word, <clears throat> word mental health, is the embedded assumption ambiguity, which is often not surfaced. When I was a doctoral student, <clears throat> one of my professors said, <clears throat> the sign of mental health sanity is the ability to handle ambiguity. That's a whole hour's discussion of what ambiguity really is and how we really handle it. I won't go into that right now. So yeah, there, so some of the things I think we need to talk about are psychotherapy per se, and I would say my little opinion at the outset, the word orthodox is not magic. Jesus said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is gonna get into the kingdom. Not everybody who says orthodox, orthodox is necessarily recommendable. I know orthodox therapists who really believe in abortion, who really believe in euthanasia who really believe in the death penalty and use the word orthodox more as a marketing <laughs> word than a word of shared value so so there's care in that and i think we need to explore explore that some we need to talk about medication what's the role of medication and there are prominent orthodox persons who say we don't need medication that that the religion orthodoxy itself as all that we need, all we need is asceticism and a hundred Jesus prayers or a hundred million Jesus prayers and a spiritual father or mother and on we go without therapists or medication. So yeah, we are a nation over medicated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Time Magazine had a cover a while ago of Ritalin. Our children are over medicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's no reason to keep proper medications from persons who need it. And my own experience is those persons who, who advocate no help 
either medication or therapy for those who need it, are usually well healed persons with a roof over their head and meals in their belly, not sleeping under a park bench in the middle of the winter time, which is where some mental health persons are. I think we need to talk about that. I think we need to talk about addictions, the role of orthodoxy in addictions, orthodox recommended helps. And the last little thing I'll say in this little introduction is, I think we need to talk about a shift in psychology, theology of the way people relate, the role of narrative and the role of vulnerability. I know in times gone by, I've been Orthodox 40 years, uh, way back, the assumption was persons came to seminary, seminaries, in order to learn theology, go out into the field, be a warrior for Christ, do Christ's work in the parish, and die. Well, that's produced some jaded priests at this point, simply because it's not a way to live. We can't live alone. We need a support structure of each other, for each other. So there's a whole movement now of clergy peer learning groups, TIM, the organization that has a half million dollar grant, <clears throat> to try to help all of that. So. Uh, so with that, I will stop. Kate, can you uh, uh, pick up on some of those things and particularly share a little bit about uh, the integration of, of uh, and utilization of all of these different sciences uh, to approach a real human being with all the complexities of each person? Absolutely. Um, Dr. Rossi, you provide a perfect segue into talking about vulnerability, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, because one of the elements for me that's essential when we're talking about mental health and mental illness is understanding how the human being was created. And sometimes we think that being vulnerable is related to sin or fallenness, and that's a mistake. Um, the early church councils established you know, all, all of these questions about who Christ was and who the human being was. And one of the elements that we sometimes only apply to human beings and we forget applies to Christ's humanity is this church term called passibility. And that, that's the ability not only to experience suffering, but also to experience emotion. That's, that's the descriptor for how we are constructed as human beings to be vulnerable toward one another. And ultimately, that's an icon toward being vulnerable toward God. Um, so if we misunderstand vulnerability to be something to be avoided, we're missing out on the richness of what it means to be open to one another and open truly to God. And we're, we're compromising our ability to be full, full human beings. So before we kind of talk about the, the mental health aspects of um, Orthodox theology and how those dovetail, it's important to establish a clear understanding of how our faith describes the human being. Each human being, like Dr. Rossi said, uh, is a composite of the body, the mind or the psyche, uh, and the soul. Because we are a composite, though, we cannot easily separate out what faculties belong to the mind, the soul, or the body. We do everything as full human beings, not as floating minds or separated bodies. All of the parts of us work together, and like when something becomes injured in our body, we rarely think about how we function until something goes wrong. When we are mentally healthy, we might forget that the mind and the soul are different parts of the human being because they're cooperating and functioning together. We forget that the body and the mind are separate when we can think and then act simultaneously on those thoughts because it seems natural. But when one experiences an injury or a dysregulation to an aspect of what it means to be human, we suddenly notice that we are really spiritual beings, physical beings, and mental beings. And when one of those parts of us is wounded, it actually impacts the entire person. The trouble for us as Orthodox is when we put these aspects of how God created us into conflict with one another, as if one part, usually the soul, can exist over top of the others without the others. The mind cannot be healthy without the body, or the body be healthy without the soul. If we make it sound like mental health resources are in competition with spiritual resources, we fundamentally misrepresent the composition of the human being. And this is not to say that therapists or mental health professionals, um, either orthodox or secular, may not also misrepresent the human being. 
Certainly not all physicians are respectful of our Orthodox faith. But we cannot be tempted to fall into that same imagined treatment for mental illness or decline in mental health as fundamentally running opposite or counter to Orthodox spirituality because that misunderstands our composition and God's created design. We are not only souls, we are also bodies and minds. And while each of those areas impact the other, it often takes some real investigation to discover where our troubles are rooted and how to treat them. When St. Basil was establishing the first hospital system, he explained how the Christian should approach medicine. He says that to have a flourishing soul, we must attend to the needs of the body. If the body is uh, hungry or naked, diseased or struggling, if it has any lack at all, it will impact the mind and the soul of the person. So for St. Basil, caring for all of the members of the human being is an act of faith, as long as we recognize that it is truly God who, who heals us, he who is the creator of our bodies and the author of our faith, our great physician. When we strive for health, we must remember the way that we are made and then investigate how we think of ourselves. We, if we secretly believe that the soul is more important than the body and then discredit what our body needs, we put parts of our humanity in competition. St. Paul is clear that no part of the human body is greater than the other. The eye is not more important than the hand or the foot. And he was using this analogy to remind us not to be jealous of each other's gifts. But that analogy makes no sense if we really do think that the eye is better than the hand. The soul is better than the mind or better than the body. Mental health uh, is something that we should think of on a sliding scale. We can have greater mental health um, or poorer mental health depending on stressful life experiences. Mental health is the level to which we are thriving in our thoughts. This includes our self-concept, our expectations of support from others, our expectations of success and well-being. If something very stressful happens, anyone can experience a decline in mental health. For Orthodox, it's very tempting to collapse mental health and spiritual health together because they often feel very similar to us. When mental health declines because of life circumstance, it can actually expose an unhealthy spiritual life. Um, and because of that, we notice that we lack spiritual habits or resources that would have otherwise helped us have faith in God during times of difficulty. In such a situation, both mental and spiritual parts of the person must be addressed. But it is certainly, conversely, also possible for a person who puts a great deal of effort and attention into their spiritual life to be very spiritually healthy and also experience a sudden decline in mental health. Tragedy, for example, uh, may shake our outlook and may make, our doubt, make us doubt ourselves, doubt our own ability to survive pain or loss without shaking our faith in God. Likewise, if you experience a decline in mental health for a period of 12 months or longer, that may actually be a sign of mental illness. A lack of mental health is not the same thing as a mental illness, but the vast majority of mental illnesses appear during very stressful life events where mental health may be low. This isn't because the stress of life actually caused the mental illness, but rather that this crisis in life brought out an illness that may run in your family or may have actually been in the background since adolescence, but only now has become acute uh, enough to affect your life. In this situation, the impact on the mind feels like the most profound symptom. The inability to think or expect positivity from the world, a negative opinion of yourself despite seeking encouragement or praying. Not all bodily illnesses impact only the body. So if you have attended to your soul and put forth effort to focus your thoughts, um, and you're still experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety that are getting in the way of your life, that may be the body's needs impacting the mind and the soul in the form of mental illness. And in the case of bodily conditions, treating that lack, whether with therapies or pharmaceutical help, enables the person to regain balance and health. For St. Basil, Attending to our bodies gives us the opportunity to recognize that we are dependent on God, to go back to that dependency. We are dependent on God and on one another. We can control, we can't control whether or not we become ill, but we can control how we turn to one another. 
the faithful response when we experience lack in our body, mind, or soul is to treat our entire selves with grace. Treating the body for a mental illness can be an act of faith if we apply St. Basil's words, because we can properly understand that our faith is in God and not in medicine for healing and recovery. Thank you. Uh, Al, if, if I could put you on the spot, when someone is feeling overwhelmed and, and uh, having trouble functioning, uh, what do you do to help? It's a great question. I run into that all the time, as do you, as do you, Kate. And each situation, person, is different. <clears throat> the general answer is contact, connectivity. Get out of yourself, talk to me, talk to somebody else. Let's get words on your overwhelmness. Let's make it implicit, explicit. So beneath that, then, is the clarity of transparency and accountability. So if someone says to me, I'm overwhelmed, I say, I'm very honored that you're telling me you're overwhelmed. Let's see what we can do a little bit about that. You might if I ask a couple of questions. And then I'll probe. Please expand the word overwhelmed. What is it? When was it? How was it? Where is it? And so on. And more often than not, most of the time, the person is overwhelmed, but you know that sometimes um, can be greatly benefited by that conversation. That is to say, simply talking to another human and not isolating the evidence within my brain can in itself do something. Now, there may be much more to say than that, but that's for starters. Kate, how do you start a conversation with? someone who comes to you that's overwhelmed or frightened or um, anxious? I think especially lately, I'm noticing that a lot of our parishioners have questions around when to seek um, pastoral help. And a lot of times, especially vulnerable people who are going through a new experience, um, a loss of a child or a loss of a spouse, something that's extreme, but also they're feeling feelings of shame and humiliation at not being able to kind of overcome on their own. Um, those are the times when I think, wow, we, we need to have a conversation about how confession and prayer operate. We struggle, I think, a lot with articulating the goal of confession, prayer, um, and, and maybe, maybe the sacraments in general. But uh, Father Hopko was the one who really articulated it best that we should have a level of buoyancy when we're coming to confession. That's not the place where we have shame. That's the place where we lay our shame down at Christ's feet. Um, and so for us, I think it's really important to remember that access to the liturgical life is where we focus on the fact that our identity is in Christ. Christ has not forgotten who we are when we're in the middle of a crisis or when we're experiencing the very real and very scary early onset of a mental health condition. Christ is the one who remembers who we are. And and um, it's Zizulis who says that he holds us, he holds our identity in his hands in the eschaton, outside of time. So we get really trapped in the ideas of progression and healing and really putting a lot of effort in. But we need to remember that we're accepted by Christ and he knows our identity even when we forget what our identity is. We, we can forget that we are absolutely beloved. Uh, we can forget that it's a beautiful thing to open up to one another. And it's a beautiful thing for a person who's not going through a crisis to bear the burden of a, another who is. Um, so I think when someone comes to me in crisis, I try to turn back to a, a reference of how the church can point us toward that identity in Christ, that identity that, um, that is outside of what we're currently experiencing um, so that we can feel secure. Uh, Al, this idea of identity is, is one that, that you talk a little bit about sometimes uh, when people are feeling not themselves. And, and um, uh, I guess it's another way of saying super overwhelmed. Uh, where do you start? Great question. And I'll back up a moment and 
say that for me, the way I really try to teach the students the same batteries, is the first response always is active listening. When someone says anything to me, my first response is not preachy and not bringing them to some level I think they should be at, but indicating, hey, I heard that's, I define, I say, active listening is love delivered. That said, identity. Um, for me, the first thing to say about that is, as a human, I happen to be a clinical psychologist, but I need to get my own identity more and more focused, like the Nikon camera to continue, and that's done by self-care often neglected by those of us in religion. I fly a lot, or used to fly to Little India, and it still irritates me, but I know it's valid. When the flight attendant comes to the center aisle, man or woman, says, in case of an emergency, we don't expect one, but if there is one, oxygen masks will descend from the ceiling. Those of you holding infants will get two oxygen masks, Put the oxygen mask on yourself first, then on the infant. Every time I hear that, I have this Italian grandfather reaction. Oh, I want to take care of my infant. The first thing I want to do is take care of my puppy. No, no. If you don't put it on yourself first, you both might perish. That's a metaphor for identity. I need to take care of myself. I need to get a reasonable night's sleep. I need to eat as healthily as I can. I need to get reasonable exercise as the very basic. And going over those things, in many of us, um, it's often diminished or lacking in the name of greater good. Oh, no, I have to set up five soup kitchens or whatever it is. In the meantime, the identity is diminishing. So, so that's where I would start. Then about the identity of the other that you're talking about. Again, it's individual, person to person, but it's done by listening and then many different ways, but soft questioning without coming into some little mini lecture about prayer and fasting. That could come when trust is earned and there is a place for, by the way, in self-care, I put meditation. I meditate every day. Brother Humphrey in his 55 Maxims says, Every Christian, Orthodox or not, should meditate 20 to 30 minutes a day. Well, I give a lot of parts of the That's the hidden secret of Orthodoxy, whether it's with priests or parishioners or whatever. So I, I would, I think meditation is something to be talking about in terms of mental health. That's where we get our real identity, because our real identity is Christ in me. I live now in the high of Christ in me. So within there are two selves, a light self and a dark self vying for prominence. At some point, as you're suggesting, my dark self has prominence and overwhelms me. I get to my light self by being read out of it gently. I, 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 when I'm engaged, I'm questioned, I think about things that have gone right, I think about things that I'm grateful for. And then the light begins to dawn my Christ goes slowly. That's what I would say about that. Now, when a priest or a counselor or a friend feels overwhelmed themselves by, by the anxiety of the person who has come to them, um, what do you recommend? There are two basic questions. First, active listening. Let me hear if I'm hearing you right. <clears throat> First question, okay, okay, okay. What would you say are some of the ingredients of the overwhelmness? Try to separate a bit, dissect it a bit. And the second question, okay, 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 where could you start to begin to change something in that mix? Often, you know, I'm diabetic and my husband just left me and me, 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 me. Okay, where can you start? What's one thing? you can identify as a, as a comfy thing to begin to work at to be less overwhelmed. That's a mindset that the overwhelmed person needs to be grasped. I'm so overwhelmed I have no idea where to start. 
So the counselor's place might be to help the person get, get, get started in the real world, you know, deal with the whole mess at one time. And then, you know, once the trust is established, just say, it's, it's okay to be overwhelmed because we all get it sometimes and you're not going to solve the whole thing all at once. But be grateful for a little step in an unoverwhelmed direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate, when is it ethical, since you're, you're uh, an ethicist, when is it ethical to, to um, uh, refer to somebody else? Oh, gosh. Um, I think probably the, the, better, the better way to think of that is uh, isolation's not healthy. So if you're, if you're not referring and you're not connecting, um, you may be doing yourself some harm, you know? No, I, I see this a lot with, especially with clergy. Um, and I think a lot of it is because we spend a lot of time with monastic texts or ascetic texts and we, we lose some frame of reference when we think that those lifestyles are done in isolation. They're not, the, the things that we read um, often are, uh, I, I just did a talk for O Camper on, um, on uh, Elder Thaddeus in the book, Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. And one of the most common errors that we make is when we read the individual sounding language as though he's really talking about each person alone. And he's not. His, his context is a monastic context where people are living together. And he's sensitive, as most monastics are, to, to our need for one another. Um, we're not all living in isolation and we shouldn't be living in isolation. And even those who did live in isolation only did it for a time and they were doing it to pray for others, opening themselves up. And so sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it's not one person crusading or trying to find the depression in their congregation and be that strong shepherd that can burn you out. And it can also alter your concept of your relationship with God. If you think that, the role of being a shepherd is done in a superhuman kind of way, you know? Um, so I think it's always right to make an assessment of how to connect the person who's coming for spiritual advice or confession or therapy. It's always right to think about how to get on their mind, how they're going to connect with their support system, you know? And instead of just relying on, the therapist or the priest to be exclusively that support system, which is an unhealthy relationship that's going to burn both people out. To, and, and that can that happens because we're calling we're calling the priest father. There's a sort of power dynamic there, and so it's natural that you would struggle with that. But at the same time, if we refer each other back to the life of the community and our and our daily support systems, um, that can be really manageable. You know, just like Dr. Rossi saying, referring a person back to a small piece of something they can manage. Um, that's always done with other people. You know, I can't change my habits by myself. I have to reach out to someone else who has those good habits I'm trying to learn. So by, by the very nature of, of going through the spiritual life or going through a therapy where I'm trying to change my habits, I need other people. So it's, it's always an ethical choice for a caregiver, like clergy or, um, or a mental health practitioner or chaplain to remind the person that it's right for them. It's, it's morally right to reach out to trusted others um, and to open themselves up in that way. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Al, what might collaboration between uh, clergymen and a um, mental health practitioner uh, look like on behalf of of helping a um, uh, uh, the people that that we 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 serve, I guess both ways, the clergy informing and helping the practitioner and the practitioner working with the clergy on behalf of the client or penitent. If you don't mind, I'll answer that, and then ask a question to you, please. Collaboration between the priest and a therapist, um, I think is vital, but more often than not lacking. And I think either side can initiate it, mm -hmm. as a therapist initiated, not a priest. 
And I think that the priest, more often than not, is the one who initiates it. So if a person comes to a priest and says, I'm overwhelmed, I just need to talk to a therapist, and, you're making me. and the priest says, well, I have somebody who's really quite good. I recommend this person. Um, and, and do I have your permission to talk to this person who are in your therapy? So right from the get-go, the priest says, verbal, uh, okay, make contact. So then when the person goes to the therapist for a session of two or three, then the priest can, on his own, call the therapist and say, you've seen Sophia, I'm really glad you are, and she gave me permission to talk to you, so I'd like you and me to talk a bit, and you know, look, I'll tell you my impression of Sophia, you tell me your impression, you tell me where you think I can help more, and I'll tell you what I think you might dwell on a bit more like that. So that's my answer now. Question, <laughs> good bishop. Uh oh. Uh oh, <laughs> look on. Uh, I have put you on the spot before, as you know. The Kate and I have both answered all the questions you've asked, and I'm really grateful for your answers. How would you handle the person, priest or other, who comes to you and says, Oh, I am just so overwhelmed, I think my head is imploding? How do you handle that? I uh, usually I, I I start by saying there are times uh, my mama told me there'd be times like this when <laughs> everything seems to be going wrong at the same time and and um, we're just snowed under so I, I typically take a pad of paper and say let's just make a list of of all the areas and and see uh, if which ones relate to each other and and see what you can do with with at least some of them. So just to kind of break it up into pieces is... is that, that's great. And I know zillions of people who turn to you for solace, better mental health, consolation. And I would just add to that, I usually end my session or sometimes begin them with, okay, 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 please, Tell me one thing you're grateful for. That's often a conversation stopper because it stops this whole flow of dark thinking. La 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 la. It's almost like a runaway train. Stop, please. Oh well, I'm thankful that I was able to plant my garden yesterday and not my tomatoes because it did get cold last night and I'm going to plant my tomatoes next week. Then I can almost feel the person's heart softening. So I would simply inject gratitude. Thank you. Kate, how do we know if, if, if we need mental health help? What, what would you use as kind of a um, uh, uh, test for yourself to see when yeah, to seek yeah. help and, and what kind? I think, you know, when, when things tip over and you can no longer maintain your normal lifestyle, you know, that's usually what clinicians uh, 12, 12 months or longer is a sign that you may have a mental illness shorter than that it still matters right your a decline in mental health still matters even if you don't have a mental illness and if you do have a mental illness that's kind of blossoming out of a stressful life event it's great to get get to a clinician earlier than 12 months right so it's it's whether or not it really disrupts your life and from an orthodox perspective i think you know I touched on this a bit that we need to understand that the body, the mind and the soul are interwoven and complex, but they, they do have some delineation. So if you've spent time with your priest and you've been diligent about altering your thought life, using prayers um, and other things like what Dr. Rossi just said, like asking yourself what you're thankful for, if that doesn't have a long-term impact on the, the way that you're feeling, if you're still having extreme anxiety or depression, that, that's where you can start to ask questions of, is this, is this something that my body is experiencing and I need to, I need to have a physician, I need to have a, a clinician's help because my, my spiritual health is, is good, it's stable. I'm trying as much as I'm able to think positively about myself and others and to maintain a positive outlook on the future that's usually one of the signs of um 
of depression that's lasting a long time, clinical or otherwise, maybe a mood disorder, that, you know, try as you might, you just can't keep your thoughts focused on the good. And that's where some of, that's where some of our theology can feel awful to people who are struggling with protracted um, mental health decline or mental illness, where we're reminded constantly to keep our thoughts focused on Christ. But if, you, if there's a physical condition that's getting in the way of that, um, it's good to remember that St. Basil thinks about these aspects of the mind as physical. You know, there are some things that relate to your mind that are coming from the body. And it's only right to treat the body to free up the mind. So I think there, where you're, if you're making efforts, um, you're reaching out to others, and they're also telling you, yes, you are making strong efforts, and you're getting feedback, and you're still not experiencing a shift, that's, that's when you need to seek some mental health care. Thank you. Uh, Dr. L, uh, this word ill is one that people are often afraid of and feels shame and, and dread and, uh, and, and such with. Can you put that in a spiritual context uh, for us so that we can kind of um, deal with it better or differently? Important question. Can you hear me? It's a really important question, and I don't have a short, crisp answer. That is to say, the word ill, when it comes to mental and spiritual states, in orthodoxy, really is as a bias, for good or not good reasons. I think not good reasons. And the only way I would know to help a person like this or in a public talk is to do it gradually. Father Schmem used to say, orthodoxy needs three things to move forward. Education, education, education. So we need to slowly educate the person or the group about what illness is, that we all are ill at various points, that the human thyroid produces thyroxin, and if it doesn't produce enough thyroxin, then you go to a physician and you get some thyroxin, and you do that. If the brain isn't producing sufficient neurotransmitter serotonin, you're gonna get depressed. Well, if that's the case, then you need more than a bicycle and a vegetarian diet and, and a, a nice aesthetic uh, practice because you require some serotonin. Take a little pill, take some Zoloft or something, and then, or so there's a the whole thing to say about brain chemistry, but that's where this comes in. And often those who are not attuned to helping people who could be helped, we, we don't comprehend the depth that you, I know I talk to a schizophrenic at least once a week, I've been for years, how deep and dark this can get. I'll be crass, no harm in being raw. One time in New York City, I was walking down the street, summertime, there was the woman pushing a cart that seemed to be all her belongings. She seemed unkempt. I just said to myself, there's a person who's in some trouble. I then saw her take newspaper from the top of the cart, take it out to the curb, put it on the floor, lift up her dress, defecate into the paper, roll it up and throw it in the garbage, and then keep on going. Well, that, I don't judge her, but that's her life. So to say she shouldn't have Thorazine to help her become more, more conscious, I think is simply a dysfunction. So with the word illness, I don't mind the word illness. Mm -hmm. I'm a recovering alcoholic. We'll talk about addiction some other time. But in the world I live in, recovery of addictions, the word illness is used. That is to say, my alcoholism is a disease because my brain chemistry and my liver are changed because of my use of alcohol. So call it what you will, my body has a dysfunction, a disease, an illness that I better attend to. Because if I, I haven't had 
alcohol improperly for 20 years, <clears throat> but I go to two meetings a week. If I would drink excessively now, as I did, my liver would be right, and my T cells in my brain would be right back to where they were. That is to say, I have a, for lack of better language, <clears throat> a latent illness. That is, I better be careful for. But every body on the planet is a fallen body of Adam and Eve. And has something that's not perfect. Whatever it is, my earlobes <laughs> or my pancreas <laughs> or something. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kate, we've talked a lot about um, uh, illness. Uh, uh, how do you feel about illness? And you've also spoken a little bit about shame. And how do we get around the shame so that we can um, deal with disease and illness? I, I think the idol of shame looms large in the background, you know. Um, I, I'm the a, idol, the yeah, idol of yeah, shame? We think yeah, we think we're doing something really good by participating in, in shaming ourselves and shaming others. Like, I think we, a lot of times we confuse shaming ourselves with being pious, you know, as if that's something that God really desires for us is to be humiliated, you know? And that, when we confuse Orthodox spirituality, I mean, we just came off of Lent, right? Like, when we confuse fasting for depriving ourselves or beating down our bodies, we're unraveling so much of our orthodox faith by doing that you know god created our bodies to be good so we need to be good to it and i think that the shame that we confuse to be piety comes up when we think about illness clinicians the, the reason why they say mental illness is not to be stigmatizing it's so that you can convey to the person that this isn't all of who they are any more than getting a cold you know or getting covid 19 right now was a chosen thing that's not a part of who you are. You didn't put yourself in a position to get a virus. That's just what it's like to be a human being. You know, there's a whole host of factors as to why your immune system would become ill. And that's exactly how mental illness can be thought of. I I'm a fan of thinking of mental illness in that way, as long as we think of illness in that way. And I think we have a hard time thinking about physical illness too, in a way that isn't stigmatizing. Our bodies are vulnerable, they just are. That's how we were created. And ultimately, that is something that orients us toward God. But it can also welcome pain into our lives. And so it's, it's kind of an easy and natural thing to say, well, if I wouldn't have done X, Y, Z, I wouldn't be in this situation. But all of us are fallen. All of us make mistakes in our pursuit of becoming more like Christ. And for us to think that becoming ill in our bodies could be like Dr. Rossi, your, your comment about like eating a vegetarian diet or, you know, there's, there's a whole host of kind of self-help books about nutrition and about diet. And maybe there's, maybe there's a golden nugget in each of those books that might be helpful. But I'm really concerned about Orthodox folks thinking that by restricting certain aspects of how we are as humans, we can escape being vulnerable. We can't escape being vulnerable. We can't control, you know, we can't determine whether or not I get a cold or a virus. I can't determine whether or not my child becomes sick, you know? And when we think that we can, that's where the stigma and the shame comes in, where if I think that I can prevent my child from running a fever, then I'm a horrible mother for ever allowing him to get sick. I did not allow him to get sick in any, in any way, shape, or form. His body was created to be vulnerable and susceptible and passable, and it's vulnerable to the elements. So if I break that down and I say, this isn't my moral responsibility, or po it's not a possible reality that I could prevent injury or pain or illness, then that's where we can start to break down this shame that lives in the background where we think it's my own responsibility to control every little thing. You know, and I think it just becomes the most acute when we're talking about people with mental illness, because those are already people who are struggling. So they need the support of others in, in an immediate way. And then we can see the damage that that does when we're, we're shaming. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Would you go so far as, as to um, suggest that illness offers 
both the person ill and the uh, people who surround the ill person as an opportunity to tap into God's grace, God's love, uh, even God himself? I think yes, with a caveat. Um, it would be a mistake to say that suffering in and of itself is meaningful. Suffering, like you said, is an opportunity. And it's, it's our responsibility to partner with God to convert that pain into meaning. So I hear a lot of people, especially who struggle with mood disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, who experience an absolutely absurd amount of daily pain just by the nature of the disease. I hear a lot of people tell me that they, they have had parishioners who are saying this with love, but are mistaken, that they're undergoing this experience to become closer to Christ. And it makes it sound like there was some sort of malicious intent in the way that God created them so that they would experience the sufferings of Christ. Sure. And they'll ask, questions. they'll ask questions about how, how do I think of God then? That God, that God sounds awful, that he would do this to me. So I think it's important for us not to think that way and to think that the, the opportunity is there for us to make meaning out of pain. We have to do that. We have to make the meaning. But if I'm going to suffer anyway, certainly it would be uh, beneficial to use it as a time to come closer to God, Absolutely. closer to humanity, closer to my own humanity, and to even understand better uh, who I am as, as, as human, because humans by nature are vulnerable. Yep. We don't have big turtle shells to... Um, uh, protect us from hell. And I think uh, we, all, we all know people who don't convert their suffering into meaning. And that is a very lonely life. That is not the, we, we know because we, we just experienced Pascha. Suffering isn't our eternal state. You know, the resurrection includes us. And so I do think that it's the Christian imperative to convert that into meaning. But just like how Dr. Rossi is describing each individual as having their own variety, each person converts that into meaning with the partnership of God in totally unique and robust ways. And that's a part of the gift of being the support person, is you get to witness that mystery unfold in partnership with the person if you're supporting them. You know, I think a lot of times we have an expectation of how somebody should suffer, and that's, that's restrictive, and that can be shaming. Um, but I think you're 100% on the money there, Your Grace, to say, this is an opportunity for us to experience something together that is mysterious and can, can give us a glimpse of what the renewal we're supposed to be experiencing in Christ's resurrection actually looks like on this side. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Al, uh, when, when should a counselor or a friend send someone to confession? When should a counselor or a friend send someone to confession. Um, of course, I would bracket out the word send. <laughs> okay, I'm a bishop and bishop send. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a lay person. Too. So um, what I do as active listening as I can and as softly and as gently as I can, work my way, I don't start here, but I work my way around with a question. Might I ask, I ask permission, might I ask you when the last time you went to confession? And then the person is free to say, I don't want to tell you, or it's been 15 years, or whatever. So I would start with that little opening, the nose of the camel in the tent, and then get the whole camel in the tent. Well, now let's talk about that a little bit, please. You have been to confession in, you know, two years. Are you interested in going to confession? Do you think it would help you? So, so it would be, as Kate says so nicely, mutual. It would be a conversation about going to confession. And then I would try to get the person to come to his or her own conclusion. Yeah, I think it might be good if I went to confession. Hey, I really do. And if the person doesn't come to that, then I would not be reluctant to saying, if you don't mind, I'll give you my little opinion. I think you would be helpful if you did go to confession. I also have no problem asking permission. Do you mind if I ask who your confessor is? I often find out 
well, my confessor moved away and I don't have one. Well, do you think you should get one? Who might be in your purview to become your confessor? So it's a whole series of back and forth questions and answers led by me and trying to quote, send the person to confession. Person to go. Thank you. Kate, can I put you on the spot with the same question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've actually been doing a lot of research as to confessional practices, um, both in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. And for us, unlike Western churches, confession um, confession's kind of like, it focuses on the person and not necessarily on the brokenness. And so I think that it's, it's important maybe to uncover why the person hasn't been to confession. What is it? What misconception about confessional life is holding you back? Is it, is it a mental picture from movies about this like shame and, you know, entering into a dark church and speaking to a priest behind a screen and, you know, having to lay out everything you've ever done wrong in detail, right? Is it the humiliation of that that keeps you from going to confession? And then for me, I often introduce um, the goal of confession, why we look at the icon of Christ and not at the priest, you know, why, why it is that we apologize for things we don't even know we did. And the, the purpose behind that is to focus back on our baptism, who we are in Christ's full acceptance. And, you know, it's Thomas Hopko who talks about how we should have this light feeling. And I mentioned that earlier, this buoyancy, this feeling of being relieved because we're understood. And we're coming to confession because we have forgotten who we are. I, I have forgotten who I am in Christ and who I was created to be as a good creation of God. I've forgotten that. I've mistaken my nature to be sinful and I've gotten off track somewhere and I have thought that this sin is who I actually am. And it's through that relationship um, with Christ that's made present to us and looking at the icon of Christ that we're actually, we're actually speaking to him ourselves. It's through that, that I see how loved I am, how capable of good I am, how interrelated I am to my community, how affected I am by changes in my life. Um, and how like, I'm a finite person. I can't remember all the things I've done wrong. And that's not the point. The point is that I get these things off my chest and I put myself into a vulnerable relationship with Christ and with the priest and with my community who I need forgiveness from and who needs forgiveness from me. And through that entire network, I'm reminding myself of how I was created to be. And we lose sight of that. We lose sight that this is a restoration. So those are the things that I think, um, you know, establishing what keeps us from confession and then correcting those misbeliefs. Thank you. Uh, Al, what can parishes do to, as, as faith communities to promote mental wellness or holiness uh, or spiritual health? Great. Great question. You've been asking great questions and keeping the flow of this moving nicely. There are many things to say about that. I'll simply excerpt one and deal with it because I've experienced it. I think that parishes, parish priests particularly, <clears throat> can begin to identify common elements, common threads, common inclinations, common sins, if you will, and then form small groups and see if you can get them forward. For example, a parish I know, I have talked with, the priest has four young men who are addicted to internet pornography come to the confession. They're isolated. He's made suggestions. They haven't followed through too well. He's managed to get the four of them together and having them meet. And he had me go in and talk with them one evening and just share as they chose. And if they don't want to share, that's fine. About them. That's really very powerful and empowering. And I happen to be on the kick right now of small groups. I am in the process right now working with OCF. OCF has a really wonderful thing going where for a long time it's been localized. Students at Pitt go to Pitt OCF. Or Arizona students, University go to Arizona. Now we're forming groups of six <clears throat> across the country. 
So sign up if you'd like to be part of one of these groups. We have 10 male facilitators, some 10 female facilitators. 150 students have signed up. They're in their third week doing this now because of the pandemic. But what they're learning is, oh my, now I'm in contact with a person my age who's orthodox, believes just like I do, and we can talk like mm, friends and human beings. So small groups, and you know, uh, you race from having been part of one of the training sessions for priests. I've trained over 50 priests and lay people to be facilitators of small groups. So it's an OCF, St. Vitamins. Last night, I had a small group, which has met weekly for 21 weeks, of students. We call it Christian self-care, and we talk openly uh, and confidentially. That's really one of the convenience of small groups. Whatever we say here stays here. We don't want this broadcast to other people, so we can trust each other. So that's one of the first things I think parishes can do, apart from larger parish-wide discussions. But I think that small groups have a really strong chance for handling particular issues. Thank you. Kate, what do you do? What can parishes do to um, uh, promote health? And spiritual health, uh, uh, mental health, physical health. I, I think making a concerted effort to discuss these topics on a regular basis instead of reserving them for special tragedies is a way to maintain, um, maintain a, a perspective of mental health that we need to be attending to our mental health, uh, just the same way that we attend to our spiritual health. You know, we mentioned spiritual uh, disciplines and prayer and prayer guides or favorite prayers for different occasions. Um, we need to get into the habit of discussing mental health and self-care in the same way so that it just doesn't become, you know, it doesn't become a special thing or a thing <coughs> we need it. You know, we discuss it regularly and just like, just like any other form of caring for ourselves and becoming more like Christ, that's just you know, a way that we maintain ourselves. And I think, I think part of the reason why we're uncomfortable doing that is simply just because we, like, just like when you have a sore muscle and you need to work it out. You know, we don't have the muscle memory and the habit of discussing our intimate lives like this. You know, it can be awkward. Um, so just kind of getting over that hump slowly and discussing mental health on a regular basis between parishioners, between priests, and integrating that into sermons, integrating that into small group conversations or to women's gatherings, um, just so that we know, you know, who we are. We're reminded that th this is an important part of our lives. Uh, Al, do you have any final closing remarks? That I do, if you don't mind, a couple bullet points. Uh, one of the things that has crossed me a lot recently, when a person needs psychotropic medication for whatever reason, whether it's excess anxiety or depression, <clears throat> we need to direct that person to see a psychiatrist, not the family doctor, because most people when they say, oh yeah, I really do have, I feel like I'm depressed, situational, this and this and this, I need some medication, I'll go to my family doctor. As often as not, that turns out kind of productive simply because the family doctor <clears throat> isn't astute and up-to-date <clears throat> with all of the nuances that's in that. Also, I would add in that vein, there's a diagnosis I've uncovered because I teach at a seminary, but it's across cultures, ADD. Now, it's very easy to diagnose ADHD. Somebody's all over the place bouncing off the wall and <laughs> ADD is a mental problem, brain chemistry, that limits a person's ability to concentrate and focus <coughs> and remember. So a seminary comes to me, oh, Dr. Rossi, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I spent two hours in the, the library and I read and read and read. And then when I walked out the door, I didn't remember a thing. Okay, what I've discovered is that there is Medicaid, proper psychiatrist, there is medication handle ADD and I have at least four seminarians who are willing to shine my shoes now because this little pill 
has made all the difference in their ability to concentrate and remember. So I wanted to say that. Um, and I would simply add as a last comment, dovetailing on what Kate said, Mother Hopko often said to me, we were dear friends, he said to me, Al, if it's not light, it's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Kate, any wrap up comments? Um, I think I'll just double back to St. Basil. Um, you know, we often say that the church is a hospital and we hear that the church is a hospital. And for people who are struggling, that can sound like this church is all we need. And if we turn to a physician or we turn to a, a therapist or we turn to a friend, that that's somehow threatening our spiritual life. But I think in context, we can remember that the Cappadocian Fathers and St. Basil as the spearhead started a hospital complex because the body is separate from the mind and the soul. And so it's entirely spiritually appropriate for us to seek physical help from doctors, um, any manner of doctors. That, that's not in conflict with the church being a hospital of souls in any regard. Um, and in fact, St. Basil, um, like I said before, um, he wants us to, he, he wants Christians to treat our bodies um, as a gateway to flourishing. But then also he describes that as an act of faith. Um, he, he gives this great analogy to um, what he calls the arts. So he says medicine is an art, um, uh, agriculture is an art, weaving is an art. And so he says, when you go to a weaver to purchase clothes, are you putting your faith in the weaver to clothe your nakedness? When, when you go to the market and you buy food that was grown by a farmer, are you putting your faith in the farmer or, or in the seed that grew the fruit? No. Ultimately, you're putting your faith in the Lord who created all of these different arts that human beings participate in. And so he sees medicine in the same way, that when you go to a physician and you need care, even if you need um, med medication for the thriving of your body and you need that care, we don't need to feel ashamed as long as we understand that it's the Lord who's guiding the hand of the physician and making these different therapies possible. And we can, we can care for ourselves in that way um, as an act of faith. Thank you very much. As the um, uh, chairman of, of this uh, task force of the Assembly of Bishops, I'm particularly grad, uh, 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 appreciative of, of your time and, and uh, your expertise today. We, to have such wonderful speakers uh, to kick us off in this particular ministry is, um, is really wonderful. Uh, one of the efforts of the task force presently is to put together a directory of Orthodox Christians who uh, work in the social sciences and to help make that list available to people who, um, and to clergy, uh, when, when, um, uh, so that we can empower and, and work together. Um, the whole, uh, uh, OCAMPRA program is one of helping professionals of different disciplines, uh, who are Orthodox, all support each other from taking the benefits of each other's um, specializations and tools and, and, and fields. So I'm really excited for what you're doing. Uh, and you two are prime examples of, of Orthodox Christians who can utilize tools uh, in the modern world to uh, connect people to Christ and, and to let Christ uh, heal and let people uh, reconcile that which is of disease. Disease is, is not at ease. And uh, with God's loving presence and his life and his love, uh, we can turn disease into ease and, and wholeness uh, and life. Uh, thank you also to all those who uh, were brave enough to listen in and, and, uh, and 
hopefully be brave enough to uh, continue to grow in, in um, uh, our spiritual journeys.